So the, the next, next guest are the Six Stones, which is a trio, uh, which consists of uh, Ngo Tramai uh, on the Dan Bao, uh, Nguyen, Nguyen Tran Tui. Sorry, I haven't practiced my Vietnamese names. I should have contacted you earlier. Uh, who's a Dan Tran player, uh, together with the guitarist and um, very eclectic musician, Stefan uh, Oster Osterio. Uh, and together they go with David G. Ebert, who's an ethnomusicologist uh, who specializes in uh, the research of online teaching methods uh, for various universities in China, uh, as well as Enric Frisk, who's an electronic composer uh, who operates at the University of Stockholm. Uh, they will discuss the concept of musical transformations um, network performance in the context of intercultural music creation, uh, looking at, among other things, at how network performance can contribute to sustaining cultural heritage uh, among migrants, uh, minorities, uh, cultures. So, okay, let's not waste any time with my silly introductions. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, so we, how many of you are present? I can see two of you now. Stefan, where are you? I am here. Uh, I think you should see me. Yes, but I mean, which, 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 uh, which location are you in? Oh, I'm in Stockholm. Um, and the presentation we will be giving now uh, will have Nguyen Tang Tui on video because she's teaching, couldn't get out of teaching. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Chami is not uh, joining. She will be heard playing the dumbo a little bit in, in okay, a couple of great. days. Um, we are, uh, the Six Tones is, is a Vietnamese group uh, or a Vietnamese Swedish group, to, different, depending on how you see it. But what we're addressing here is intercultural collaboration, but also ideas for sort of cross Asian collaboration um, through network performance. Uh, thank you. So I will uh, share screen. I, will, I swear to share computer sound. I uh, also share this PowerPoint. Uh, can you now all see it? Is that working? Yes, it's perfect. So here we go. This presentation is rather dense and we're going to try to make our way through it uh, efficiently. Remote interaction has been an important possibility in musical practice since the invention of musical notation. Already in the early days of Western art music, societal infrastructure would serve rather well for delivering scores and parts for the purpose of artistic collaboration outside of the now of musical performance. Loss of information was of course always a possibility in the postal system, but the entire chain of production and delivery equally holds a risk of loss as illustrated rather drastically when Carl Nielsen, the Danish composer, was biking to the office of his copyist and lost the original manuscript to his first string quartet. The entire score had to be reconstructed through memory. When packages of data are lost in the transmission, they are seldom the entire content, but data loss still remains a constant challenge in the digital age. We understand network performance as the real-time interaction between musicians that are geographically dislocated and may or may not involve both oral and visual communication, which today tends to be mediated over the internet. This paper discusses the possibilities in intercultural music collaboration through remote interaction using present-day technologies. Further, we also discussed the projected creation of a scene for intercultural exchange at Manzi Art Space in Hanoi, with reference to the first network performance carried out live on a scene in Hanoi on July 12, 2020, created by the Six Tones at Manzi. We seek to better understand how intercultural collaboration may be challenged and vitalized through the use of network performance, but the creation of a stage for network performance in Hanoi, we envision as a window to connect musicians across Asia, as well as to nodes in other parts of the world. This paper is structured uh, in six parts, starting out with the present introduction. It is followed by two, a background to our work on intercultural collaboration. Three, a brief account of findings from musical transformations, an ongoing research project on musical change in intercultural settings. 
fourth part is an outline of current research on network performance and intercultural collaboration, including a presentation of our plans for cura a curated series of network performances in Hanoi. Uh, five, we move it to a discussion of how network performance may contribute to intercultural collaboration in music. Uh, and we hope to also have time for some further questions and discussion at the end. Thank you. But before moving to the next section, we will first listen to remote interaction across continents in a recording made in the Transformations Project this summer by the Six Tones and Pam Kong Ti. And the full piece can be heard in a concert here in the conference uh, later on. listening to an experimental version of a song from the south of Vietnam called Vọng Cổ. Musical Transformations researches how this music has changed over time. In this video, recorded some weeks before the performance at Manzi, I was again able to play with Phạm Công Tị, one of the masters of this tradition. Due to technical limitations related to COVID-19, it was impossible to set up a real-time interaction with him, and we instead play with a video we have recorded earlier on of him playing the piece. We will return later to the possibility for musicians in exile to reconnect through the use of technology with musicians from their country of origin. 
but we will start out with an outline of the artistic research practices developed within the Six Stones, a Vietnamese Swedish group of which we are members since we formed it in 2006. A fundamental building block was the notion of mutual learning, which we thought of as a prerequisite for an encounter on equal grounds across cultural boundaries. The sharing of musical practices has also led to many hours of practicing and learning to listen differently when disciplining our bodies to perform a different music. In section three, we will hear the reflect on the processes of mutual learning in the framework of the musical transformations. Since the creation of the group, the Six Stones has been part of several artistic research projects looking at artistic processes through the interaction between the musicians in the group as well as between musicians, musical instruments and scores. The central research methods has been qualitative analysis looking at video documentation of artistic processes and of musicians' gesture in performance. Henrik? Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, good. So between 2009 and 2011, uh, we led Rethinking Improvisation, which was an international research project looking at improvisation from cross-cultural perspectives. Here we would both study improvisation in traditional Vietnamese music, as well as the role of improvisation in the encounter with experimental artistic practices. As part of the method development within the project, we sought out ways in which qualitative analysis of video can be enhanced by the method of stimulated recall. This allowed us to address the specific oscillation between insider and outsider roles that characterizes the interaction uh, within the group, uh, the group Six Tones. And in rethinking improvisation, the role of listening became a central analytical focus as a way of understanding the interaction between us. Through repeated stimulated recall sessions, we develop a shared understanding of different attitudes of performing, characterized as different modes of listening. The most recent analysis carried out in 2019 revealed more clearly how the coding and the annotations made in 2009 reflected a mutual struggle of finding a shared voice in the group. The opposed strategies of blending and creating difference, both fundamental to improvised performance, can be observed in the interaction. And just a quick note that that was my hands in the video when we were playing. <laughs> exactly. An earlier round of analysis carried out in 2012 led to an increasing awareness that the notion of mutual learning and the transparency in the relation between culture, which is pursued, was essentially flawed. A musician's listening is a useful example here. Ways of listening are learned through lifelong socialization. When a musician approaches an unknown musical tradition, learning to execute a certain novel kind of vibrato, as in Vietnamese traditional music, can be relatively quickly learned. But to hear its actual significance may or may not be possible to learn at all. Here we found that the notion of transparency was countered convincingly by Glissant in his claim for the right to opacity. By acknowledging such rights for each member of the group, an oscillation between processes based on cross-cultural understanding and a more complex form of coexistence based on trust and empathy emerged, similarly to how Glissant suggests that opacities can coexist and converge, weaving fabrics. To understand these truly, one must focus on the texture of the weave and not on the nature of its components. As previously noted, the six tones, together with David Hebert, are currently involved in a new research project titled Musical Transformations. The first part is set in the Mekong Delta and in the metropolitan city of Saigon. The second part will be looking at musicians who have migrated to Sweden, interacting with the members of the six tones through the creation of a new film by Ching Mingha. 
As a musicologist in a team of artistic researchers, the one scholar in the project who is not directly involved in creating music, my role has been to document and interpret the significance of the project activities. This is quite an interesting responsibility since the project is innovative in many ways, serving rather different purposes. On the one hand, it is ethnomusicological in the sense that we are seeking to record the traditional music performances and life stories of leading musicians in a unique style of Vietnamese music that may be understood as comprising both folk music and popular music. Like blues, the Vong Co has certain formulaic structures and performance techniques that are distinctive and unifying characteristics of the genre. And through this study, we have been making high quality studio recordings of some of its finest performers, while also learning about their experiences from the time they first became interested in music. The genre is also westernized to some extent, featuring the Vietnamese guitar, which you saw Stefan play earlier in this uh, video. It has a deep scalloped fretboard, enabling extreme forms of tremolo and pitch bending, unlike guitar playing most anywhere else in the world, and is often played with electronic amplification. Unlike traditional ethnomusicology, most of our data collection does not involve extended field work, but rather entails brief periods, often about one week in length, of sessions in recording studios. Musicians are interviewed while they take breaks from making studio recordings that are in both solo and ensemble formats. From the interviews, we have been learning much about how Vietnamese music and society have changed across several decades of tumultuous development. This highly focused approach to the research has been made possible partly because the research team includes master performers of Vietnamese traditional instruments, and there has already been ample collection of relevant documents and recordings prior to this particular project, so intercultural collaboration is foundational to the research team. However, that is only the ethnomusicological aspect of this study, for there is also an equally fascinating aspect that entails collaborative production of innovative forms of intercultural avant-garde art music. Members of the research team specialize as composers and performers of new music in the Western art music tradition, and in parts of the recording sessions, they develop unique pieces in collaboration with the Vietnamese musicians. Much of this music is rooted in the traditional Vietnamese genre, but takes it in ent an entirely new direction through variations, improvisation, and use of electronic sampling to manipulate and echo back sounds to the musicians. So there are creative responses that bring the traditional music into an avant-garde context in which it arguably becomes as interesting as many recent products developed by contemporary composers using common techniques, such as serialism, post-minimalism, or spectral music, for instance. Due to the live manipulation of samples, this qualifies as a form of electroacoustic music, and yet it has roots in a non-European traditional music and features improvisational elements. It therefore constitutes an intriguing polystylistic hybrid that is fascinating to, to listen to from either the perspective of Vietnamese traditional music or Western art music. Through this aspect of the project, it has been possible to see firsthand how musicians from different backgrounds negotiate toward finding common ground for production of new hybrid sounds that transcend genres. One specific strategy we developed for applying stimulated recall techniques in the recording studio was to ask solo performers to explain their aesthetic choices in detail when presented with two versions of their own performance of the same piece. Together, we would listen to two 10 second segments from two different takes and ask them to explain which recording of their own performance they preferred and exactly why it is the better version. For music genres that are so very different from European tradition, like Von Co, we find that this technique may be especially helpful toward developing a stronger understanding of musicianship in the context of ethnomusicological research. While we consider this to be a novel strategy, it may be understood as combining an approach that rock musicologist Alan Moore calls the track with intercultural aesthetic exploration. We selected a limited number of performers to join the recording of a double CD together with the six tones. 
The recording sessions took place in Saigon in October 2019, in the picture here. In the extended preparations towards these recordings, we explore the challenges to this tradition that emerge in the artistic process carried out through such still recall sessions with all participating musicians. During the 2018 Hanoi Music Festival, we presented the first public outcome of that ongoing work in a concert with Tham Kung Ti, Tham Ban Mon, Tung Tuang, and Long, uh, Luong Hue Chin together with the group. The music we performed was developed in October the same year in working sessions in a studio in Saigon. Uh, a different studio, in fact. Uh, the one you see here in the picture. Already through the five days we worked, it was possible to identify, with reference to the stimulated recall sessions we carried out each morning, a development from initial doubt to the creation of a form which all performers were confident to work with in the performance. In the very first sessions, all the musicians listened back to what we played on our first working day. Tan Kong Chi, who we heard playing the opening performance, said he found the first track we heard sounded wonky, muffled like music from a creased cassette tape, and then everybody laughed. He continued to say he wasn't sure if the music was to be listened to as Vonko or not. Similarly, Phạm Văn Môn thought that this music could confuse a Vietnamese listener, that they would like the aesthetic reference points that constitute the identity of this tradition. Huynh Tuấn similarly expressed that also for himself, it would be good to have something to keep in town in order to know where we are. In the stimulated recall session in the morning of November 1st, the atmosphere is different. All musicians are relaxed and smiling during the playback. And at the end of one of the texts, Phạm Công Ti says, this is good, this is different. Quinton Finns in that it has a different atmosphere, different color. <laughs> Hence, rather than discussing difference as a threat to a listener's understanding, here they embrace the new elements in music and discuss difference as a positive quality. We believe that the concert performance of the Hanoi New Music Festival in December 2018 and the next round of sessions that follows in Saigon further deepens the relation between us. After the last sessions around the European New Year, we did not meet until the recording sessions for the double album in Saigon in October 2019. On the second to the last of the recordings, they expressed in an interview how a mutual understanding has emerged in the group. Em thấy uh, uh, lần trước và lần này á, thì em thấy lần trước mình chưa có tiếp xúc, chưa nói quen, chưa có quen. Thành ra không có bằng cái đợt lần thứ hai này thay vì là thay thay nhanh thì nhận xét này chứ mình không biết làm cái tự do đó không hiểu là tự do như kiểu thế nào bị cái nhà âm nhạc mình thì Việt Nam thì coi như ngoại trình khuôn khổ và nhịp nhàng vô còn cái đề tự do thì năm nay thì nói chung là năm nay là mình hiểu ý nhau là coi như là làm rất là hay, rất là hay, hay hơn hay hơn thì đợt rồi, cái đợt rồi thì coi như là mình mới thử thôi, thử thì chưa có hiểu được là cái này nó nói chung là anh em là rất hiểu nhau và làm 
gắn bó mà làm hay lắm coi như là hay tôi nói là cái này là gắn bó hay thay vì mình à, mặc dầu đền tự do nhưng mà mình cũng hiểu ý nhau hiểu ý nhau On the last working day in the studio, we set up a longer conversation with all musicians to summarize our experience. Mon, the guitarist, mentions the experiments they have made the day before on this initiative. His idea was that the three of them should play vong ko according to every rule, but to play in three different keys. Mon compare this experience to how his listening also has changed when playing with the musicians of the Six Stones, using a Vietnamese phrase that could be translated as listening with an inverse ear. Dốc bởi vì trong thực tế có nhiều lúc tôi tôi đang đờn đó, thì nghe hai cái ông này nó rất là nghịch tai, giống như mình đang thử nghiệm cái 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 các nhạc cụ với cái nhạc nhiều cái không vậy đó. Thành ra tôi nghĩ ở cái góc độ mà thể nghiệm. À, chứ không phải là trong góc độ thể hiện dụng cổ hay chứ trong góc độ thể nghiệm thì đó là một ý kiến hay à, trước khi anh nghe nghịch tai như thế thì thì anh thấy thế nào lúc anh đàn thì anh nghịch tai thì mà lạ như hồi xưa nay là người ta nói dụng cổ là nó phải động giọng nó chỉ khác lá nhưng mà nó cũng đồng giọng thí dụ anh nói 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 khác tôi chút xíu thôi nhưng mà cũng lập tức phải về cùng chỗ tôi chứ không còn không được đi xa còn này nó giống là mỗi ba ba cái là ba ba cái khoảng cách cách xa nhau nghe nó rất là ngược tai nếu mà nếu không phải là người dưỡng dàng thì không thể nào đạt được. Mon's account of the change in his listening and the notion of the inverse ear strikes a note similar to how we have previously discussed in the cultural collaboration through the pair of musical and musicianly listening taken from Pierre Schaeffer's typology. Michel Sion observes that musical listening or invention refers back to traditional heritage to establish an accepted structures and values which it attempts to rediscover or recreate, whilst musicianly hearing or invention seeks rather to locate interesting new phenomena or to innovate in the facture of sound objects. The musical attitude rests on old values, the musicianly attitude actively seeks new ones. It is important to note that Schaeffer regards the pair of musical and musicianly listening as complementary for a musician navigating conflicting aesthetic and social systems related to musical performance, such an os oscillation between attitudes related to tradition and to the searching modes of musicianly listening appears to be a key to the artistic possibilities inherent to intercultural exchange. Rachel Swain claims that inter uh, sorry, intercultural art embodies a dramaturgy of incompleteness and suggests that thereby also audiences may, must be drawn into a negotiation of what she calls an incomplete experience that demands a kind of reckoning with the context of the intercultural nature of indigenous life worlds. Musical and musicianly listening become part of an ecology of intercultural collaboration which is intrinsically built on trust. In this liminal space between traditions, aesthetic judgment is sometimes suspended, as suggested through Swain's notion of incompleteness. Musicians from different cultures and traditions interact in a site where sharing and mutual learning often must alternate with actions based on the acceptance of the opacity of the other. In such dramaturgies of incompleteness, musicianly listening remains a central method in the search for invention in the very fabric of the musical material. In this panel, in this paper, we wish to discuss how such negotiations in a liminal space situated at the threshold between different musical traditions can be addressed through network performance. We will, in the next section, look at two central references for such artistic practice and research. So as we heard from the previous presentation, network performance has a long history that goes back several decades, but intercultural coll collaboration through network technology has been sparse. But two important inquiries, uh, combining artistic creation and systematic analytical study have been carried out by Roger Mills and Jimena Alarcón Diaz. 
In both of their projects, embodiment plays a central role. Roger Mills is the musical director of the Ethernet Orchestra, a group of musicians engaging in intercultural network performance since 2007. His research has not included projects in which he himself participated, although members of the Ethernet Orchestra have taken part. His analysis builds on the conception of how metaphors are grounded in our embodiment and suggests that image schema that underlie these metaphors constitute, quote, a useful analytical tool to examine relationships between instances of tele-improvisatory interaction and performers, verbalized reflective thoughts and experiences of that interaction, end quote. His study employs a qualitative approach similar to that of the six tones. Mills identifies three types of challenges that face musicians engaging in intercultural network performance pertaining to music and sound, some familiar tonalities, rhythms and harmony, electronic sounds, variable skill levels, aesthetic uh, tastes, and so forth. Second being cultural and social traditions, which is the things like differences in etiquette, language, and interpersonal communication. The third being perceptual, geographical separation, limited or, or, or no visual cues, delayed cues through network uh, uh, latency or interference, acoustic sound and displaced physical presence of sound, performers and audience, as well as distributed performance environments, multiple local time for dispersed performance, etc. While the first two categories are challenges similar or the same compared to any intercultural collaboration, the challenges to a musician's perception of the event in network performance is clearly distinct from interactions in the same physical space. If, as we suggest above, intercultural collaboration poses specific challenges to a musician's listening, here we encounter novel challenges that are related to timing and sound, captured through microphones and distributed through speakers, and the general issues of latency and the lack of gestural and visual interaction. Further, we must also bear in mind that each musician may experience the particular affordances of a network performance very differently, depending on previous experience of working with computers, electronic music, and in a recording studio. Similarly, Mills observes how understanding cultural variations in both these schemas is an important consideration for the analysis of cross-cultural musicians' interaction and verbalized experiences. The negotiation of cultural resistance is a key factor in intercultural collaboration. Certainly, for musicians like Ti, Mon, and Tuan, to perform without an audience in the same physical space is a great constraint since they are part of a musical culture which is very deeply embedded in social interaction with audience members. A typical performance of Von Kohl stretches over many hours and erases much of the distinction between performer and audience since typically many or most in the audience take part at some point by performing a song or playing an instrument for a bit. But the role of embodiment in networked interactions is a challenge and a possibility in other ways too. Intimo, a project designed by Simena Alarcon Dia, uh, seeks to connect women in diaspora across European cities. It can be described as, quote, a physical virtual system for relational listening, exploring the role of the body as interface that keeps memory of in migratory contexts. The system is developed to integrate the body movements of performers and their voices with an oral archive. This archive is made up of Colombian migrant women's testimonies of conflict and migration, representing a diversity of stories from different generations and regions of Colombia. In a performance of Intimo, this archive is activated by walking in the spaces in which the performance takes place using the dedicated software Memento. The archive is organized in relation to four spheres of migratory memory, body stories, social body, native place, and host lands. In addition to this interactive system, a performance also entails transmission and solidification of the performer's breathing using the software Respiro. Intimo, then, may serve as an example of how networked performance constitutes a technology that can enable embodied reconnection to place. 
In our own work, we are very keen to explore further how musicians in diaspora can reconnect to performers in their country of origin through telematic performance. So we have recently taken the initiative uh, to what we hope will become a regular scene for network performers with a base in Hanoi. For many years, we have been returning to Manzi art space, presenting installations, concerts, and film. When thinking of ways to create a wider platform for international and intercultural uh, collaboration, Nancy was to us the obvious choice. A few weeks ago, we played the first performance there with the Canadian composer and improviser John Oliver joining us from Vancouver and with Ngo Chami, the Danbao player of the group on stage in Hanoi. She was joined by long-term friend and collaborator of the Six Tones, the DJ and improviser Chi Min, a well-known performer in Hanoi and abroad. The rest of the group were in different locations in Sweden. Hence, while some of us were in our home studios or living room, Chi Min and Chi Min were facing a live audience at Manzi. Hereby, our experience of the performance but also of time was fundamentally different. This is very apparent in the moment when technology was failing. When struggling to get all lines connected from a remote side, solving tech issues remained essential for the two performers, for the two performers in the concert venue, making the show go on was the only focus. Furthermore, none of the Vietnamese performers had ever met John Oliver, uh, connected from Canada, while well, Stefan and, and I knew him since 2010. So it's obvious that the level of trust within the group was of a different order than had we all met in the same room. Under these circumstances, the particularities and possibilities of network performance makes it into a distinct format for concert performance. And still, the communication between all the participants were strong, was strong, which can be seen in the following clip.
have seen in the work of the Six Stones how building trust has been fundamental in every new collaboration. And I believe that the social interaction with Moon, the Anton was important during the first year of our work. But we have also seen the importance of creating a space for coexistence with our demand for transparency. Therefore, I wonder, is network performance a possible method for emphasizing each musician's right to opacity? Might the physical distance and the limited social interaction be a possible window for giving this space for independence to the participating musicians? And further, given the challenges to a musician's listening in intercultural collaboration, such as expressed by Moon when he speaks of listening through an inverse ear, and considering the perceptual challenges posed by the network performance situation, might we also expect network performance to invite the participants to musicianly listening? Indeed, network performance tends to be characterized by being both alone and together. Alone, if we consider performers situated in different locations, monitoring their own playing and the performance of others over headphones. To Jean-Luc Nancy, listening is characterized by resonance, by a physical sharing of sound waves in a given space, I quote. Resonance is at once that of a body that is sonorous for itself and resonance of sonority in a listening body that itself resounds as it listens, end quote. But this other listening, mediated by the prosthesis of audio technology in the global network, excludes the embodied interaction between performer and audience, but arguably also opens a window for an encounter which is not governed by traditional social conventions of, of concert venues or even of the society in which you might yourself live. Certainly, the circumstances may be similar to those of performing in a recording studio, evoking the particular loneliness but also the possibility of introspective focus afforded by such setting. What we are interested in is how further use of technology might instead create a distributed connectedness, a virtual expansion of the presence of the other along the lines suggested, for instance, by the Intimal project. But in network performance, the mediating framework can be daunting, as we have uh, heard uh, here in many situations. And in advanced communication technology, a whole range of things can go wrong. The internet was not originally built to handle high bandwidth data streaming in real time. Yet, in principle, these technologies are not more complex than other systems for performance, such as an opera house or a recording studio. But whereas the latter have developed during many years to promote one specific genre or art form, the former is a multi-purpose network with a number of different uses. But just as these traditional structures have contributed to framing the aesthetics and politics of the musical styles that they foster, we should allow specific aesthetics to develop to this particular context. This is one reason why it may be necessary to consider the structure of political and aesthetical limitations slash possibilities that also network performance institutes, especially in the context that is discussed here. In what ways does the technology limit or allow the potentialities in intercultural interaction? And in what ways is it possible to expand beyond the limitations of said framework? Returning to the main theme of this symposium, what does the case of the six tones and their projects reveal about the reality of virtuality in music? More than a decade ago in the Hungarian music journal Parlando, I published an essay centered on the question, to what extent may a virtual embodiment retain the profundity of meanings associated with traditional musical experience? This question endures, but since 2010, as we have seen, the six tones have directly explored technologically mediated performance practices in the sphere of intercultural experimental music with provocative projects that test the meanings of virtuality 
for traditional musical experience. Recently, Stefan Ustersche describes the ensemble's vision as based on an, quote, ecological and post-colonial understanding of a musician's listening. And in terms of virtuality, he argues that immersive technologies may permit the creation of transmodal experiences. Meanwhile, musicology <clears throat> has seen such landmark publications as the Oxford Handbook of Music and Virtuality and the Oxford Handbook of Social Media and Music Listening sorry, music learning. <clears throat> While we consider at this symposium the extent to which virtual musicianship may be regarded as real in the experience of performers and audiences under the conditions of a global pandemic, there are convincing signs that virtuality is increasingly defined through musical experimentation and such developments in music inevitably have broader social implications. We also find that projects like those of the six tones produce a depth of embodied understanding, simultaneously cognitive, aesthetic, and kinesthetic, that is qualitatively different from standard academic knowledge. Furthermore, network performance not only provides an inspiring new artistic vehicle, but may facilitate profound practical improvements to higher education music programs since it engenders new forms of both creative experimentation and intercultural collaboration. Innovative procedures that successfully harness this approach may empower music institutions to significantly broaden their offerings, <clears throat> extending to additional genres via international partnerships through activities enabled by streaming technologies. Indeed, these developments, whether ultimately judged as more virtual or more real, promise to advance the art of music in new directions for many years to come. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. That is the end of this uh, rather dense presentation. Right, well, thank you very much, uh, Stefan and David and Enric. This was a very uh, relevant project, very relevant to our symposium theme. It definitely raises many questions. I, I like the fact that you are looking at um, not only network performance, but the network experience and how it can inform the communication, the transmission of the musical message, uh, which obviously that's something that's, uh, that it does very, very well. Uh, but then the performance context, how this, the actual experience of what music is for is, wh what is music for? What is our experience of music at the end? Uh, that's the main question. And uh, I find this, uh, the part of your presentation looking at the recontextualization of the tradition, uh, the fact that normally this, some of the music you are performing is accompanied by a social experience and this missing for half of the performers. Um, I find this, this question very interesting. Maybe this is where we need to create a new virtual uh, culture where the music or the meaning, it's, uh, the meaning of the music itself uh, uh, mutates to. Um, Mm. I can see many faces here. All our panelists are here. So I think, uh, please go ahead, fire on. Any questions anywhere, wherever you are in the world? Hi, Scott. I, I can Hi, just make a, a, a quick comment that, that, uh, that I think you're, you're spot on there. And I think this is, these, these are some of the important questions. So, so what is the what are the possibilities, as we said, what are the possibilities and limitations of this and, and how does you know, different kinds of social experiences and expectations, how, how can we handle that within these uh, frameworks? And I, and I think that's I mean, generally really exciting. Um, I have a yeah. question for, for the group itself and the um, use of technology, in fact, um, and distributed connectedness, and also, how do you think it is possible to recreate a similar or a different experience with a different culture? So obviously, using some uh, very advanced instruments and pads and things which have granulation and all kinds of effects that are, uh, I guess, uh, 
we're used to those in electronic music, but you're applying them to a particular um, cultural uh, fabric. Do you think if you apply this to another, in another cultural setting, will the music vary tremendously? Will it be similar? And do you intend to pursue this in other contexts or um, different environments? We do, and in the, in the uh, second part of the Musical Transformation Project, which researches this form of, of um, musical change in intercultural music making, uh, we will be collaborating with music, musicians uh, who are uh, migrants in Sweden and, and coming from different cultures. So we're, uh, but it's something we've done for a long time. We started this type of projects in the, in 2004, and the group was this group, particular group was formed in 2006. So so we we are um, we are since a long time looking at the. Uh, the ways in which music changes in this type of interaction, but also very specifically how, uh, when you engage in intercultural collaboration, you're listening and the whole embodiment of being a musician must change. And that's where, you know, where I, I talk about this, uh, this uh, notion of, of being sort of between aesthetic paradigms between being in this nowhere, no man's land in between aesthetic paradigms, we experienced that very, very strongly in 2009 and 10, as we talk about here. And um, after that period, uh, one can see, I think, in, uh, we see as, as we go back to these materials, how a, a shared voice started emerging after four years of work. So this is the point we're making that intercultural collaboration through telematic performance of course poses possibilities, but also specific difficulties that have to do with the fact of, of this lack of, of uh, sharing of, of the social context. And I, I could develop on this for a very long time, how we've studied quite, uh, quite in detail how the, uh, the possibilities for collaboration only emerge after quite a, an extended period, several years sometimes, of sharing cultural uh, situations and sites and place, you know, um, and, and and this is what we refer to when talking about trust. You know, the building of trust. And uh, I think if, I very add on, if I can add on to that, just briefly, is 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 that what well, change is at at the heart of this? So it's, it's our change too. So we don't we don't come in with a with a with a fixed set of of ideas about how we want to do it. It's it's it, 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 the the this this it's really about as Stefan said, it's about trust and it's about finding uh, what is appropriate for this particular group. So in, in a sense, I mean, in a, in a wider sense, this is very, very much at odds, I think, to this sort of Western cultural ideal of finding one's true voice and, and this idea that there is a, you know, that, that you want to find your own music. This is about finding a music that, that develops in, in a frame of interaction. But the point that we're making here, and what would be great to discuss today or some other day with uh, some of you guys, um, is what are the uh, what are the novel possibilities that technology provides? You know, just taking again uh, um, Minal Alcon's project uh, as as a as, as a reference. If we create technologies that connect us, reconnect us to place what are the novel possibilities that technology offers instead of the possibility of or, or the actual impossibility of being in the same place but this is something that i i hope that we can explore much more thoroughly in the coming 10 years um I was another point say... uh, hinted at by what uh, stefan is mentioning here is the need for music venues to be modified to accommodate this kind of musical practice that you know we certainly have around the world uh, structures like concert halls opera halls and, and so on but what we don't have is um, a kind of venue for this sort of uh, streaming interactive intercultural performance and that could be something that we see in the future mm, and it's something that we've been working for um so we've we've made well, actually, David and I were, we, we made a, a Horizon 2020 uh, bid for a project that did exactly this and would reconnect performers from, from different remote locations, you know, back uh, to people who were uh, uh, migrants in, in Europe. So, um, of course, we didn't get funded, 
but the ideas are still there and we are certainly aiming to do this. Uh, and it, uh, it would depend on museums, concert halls and so on engaging, just as in this bid that we produced, uh, to, to do exactly this. Also for the sake of research and learning, it would make sense to consider this in the context of higher education institutions. Conservatoires, for instance, could have specific you know, facilities that they use for this kind of a project. Um, strangely enough, the, um, the Arizona um, end of the first project I talked about, the Cell Bites one, they did have a space like that. It was called the Sense Stage, I think. And yeah, the space that we used in one of those things was, was precisely that, a university space specifically set up for streaming and interaction and so on. I believe it, bur it burned down about 10 years ago. Um, a fire there but um yeah they were obviously ahead of their time with that mm. yeah that's great i mean it is certainly possible and these i think these spaces are also emerging as we speak mm. thank you uh, it'll be it'll be very oh there's there's a question coming up. okay we have a question coming up from uh, our attendees i think scott wilson wanted to say something too um I can see that the question is just, should I ask a question there, which I presume the answer is yes. So maybe I'll just, I was just going to briefly say that um, it was, I found this really fascinating talk and actually really um, was very pleased. Um, um, I think uh, like a lot of people, um, uh, particularly these days when I hear about these projects, I sometimes approach them with a little bit of apprehension about how, how these things are going to work. And I was very pleased to just, you know, hear about all the ways that you were thinking about the project and about how you were engaging uh, and actually what you were just saying about, um, you know, not coming to the project with your voice that you need to kind of fit, but actually thinking about what are we going to make together, which I agree completely, actually. I mean, and I, th I think, you know, is um, an interesting thing about any sort of collaboration is what are we doing together? But specifically with these, um, with intercultural things, there's always a risk and you see so many projects, particularly with, um, you know, broadly speaking, Western avant-garde music, um, whether that's, you know, electronic music or contemporary music or free improv or whatever, there's this kind of weird idea that this is somehow neutral, you know, and that we're bringing this neutral thing uh, and that anything can fit into that. And, and um, sometimes the, the effect of that seems to be that every, everything else, whether it's some other tradition or instrumental practice or anything else, just tends to get viewed as kind of like grist for the mill of what uh, you know, we are are doing um, as experimental musicians and bringing into that, um, which I think is just very, very um, naive and wrong. And um, so I was just, I, I don't, this is not really a question, it's just a comment, and I don't know if anything else needs to be said about this, but just, I just thought it was really nice to hear the way you talked about the process, and particularly the process of, of trust and the importance of trust. Um, I think that's a really wonderful way to look at this sort of thing. Um, uh, and I say that as somebody who struggled with these kind of situations myself, actually, about you know how to approach them and that sort of thing. That's all I wanted to say. So. Thank you. I mean, that's that's great, and I, I think I, I would like Thank to you. emphasize this even more. You know, because what you're saying, you know, about Westerners thinking that their music is universal is plain colonialism, and you know, it, it, we need to see that this this up you know up front that this this is not a, a, a feasible approach at all. I mean, we, we must see that our cultures are local to a certain extent. But then at the same time, you know, for us as a group, when we started it in 2006, we thought of, of it as a Vietnamese Swedish group. But, you know, only in 2010, we really began to see how we were a Vietnamese group and one of the leading proponents of avant-garde music which is Vietnamese, right? So it's not that simple, you know, and, and in 2009, we were quite engaged in the noise scene, which was emerging very strongly in Vietnam at that time. And that's, you know, for, for them, that was Vietnamese, right? So it's not, it's, it's also not simple, you know, but I think for us, it's been very important to start thinking of the group more as a Vietnamese group than as, a, as an intercultural project, actually. And our identity is much more rooted in, in the avant-garde scene in Hanoi than anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, those are very good points. I mean, somebody once, I can't remember who said this, but you know, that, that Beethoven is Japanese music. And in some sense, that's, that's true. Yeah, um, that's great. And for, and for yeah. a lot of Japanese people, that's more true than, than, than Gagaku, 
So, I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's an interesting point as well. But it's, it's not, I mean, we've done a, a, a series of projects here with Kuali music, you know, which um, is kind of Sufi devotional music, which has a kind of history with the city as well. Um, and it's always been really interesting just engaging with communities because it's, you know, for us, it's much more interesting to ask, like, what could Kuali be rather than what, can, what happens when we put Kuali into this other kind of pre-existing frame that, you know, that we bring to it. Um, you know, and, and actually, the, I mean, the local um, Asian community was really wonderful. They used to have these kind of Q and A's, and they just say, you know, well, you're not doing enough of this, and you need to focus on the text, and you need to do this, and you didn't, you know, and then they'd be like, you know, what? You asked us. We told you. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, okay. You know, that's. It felt like you're getting to more more interesting questions than, um, you know, than just kind of um, another kind of um, just pass at the cross cultural collaboration thing, um, in perhaps shallow way. Yeah, um, exactly. Because I mean, if you think we could have spent a day on that as well in this conference, I guess you know, just talk about cultural appropriation. And if you think of the the microphone and the tape recorder as the sort of perfect tool for cultural appropriation, then actually you start to see you know how there are both possibilities and of course great challenges in cultural appropriation. And it goes both ways, right? So Bach is actually Japanese, right? I thought Beethoven was African, but he's that too now. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm. Was there another question? I, I think we lost the question in the audience. Or... Uh, no, 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 no. It's yeah. uh, it was a it was a silent he question. To, he, he has to be asked ask the question, but he hasn't actually asked the question. But he's got his hand up in the chat. Really? So, okay. Yeah, he Lower all hands. Federico Visi, please ask your question. Oh, I've scared him off. He just left. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but to go back to this idea of cultural appropriation or um, post-colonial context, maybe there is a sense that the fact that we are all networked now and that most places have fairly equal access to internet communication uh, might probably produce in, in the long run a much more democratic a much more equal um, flow of uh, musical evolution, I think. Um, I mean, I have to question that idea that everyone has equal access. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, yes, you're, you're um, right. Something that's been, I'm mm. very aware of that in the debate around education. Sorry, Joe. Um, the, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an idea. It's it's been discussed a lot in this country and I imagine worldwide around education and schooling that it, it's it's been very um, socially divisive between kids that have very good internet access and those that don't. You know, it's true. It's um, true. And I think that, that well, and there's the question is. of the technology, and then there's a the question of how much uh, freedom is really allowed. On yeah, I mean, lots of things, um, aren't there? I mean, it, it, you may have an internet connection, but you may not have a computer, or you may, you know, you may only have one computer in your household, and you're all fighting over it to do your work. And, your... and this can just be another type of cultural appropriation that we just pretend that everyone has equal access to the internet. Well, that in itself is just wrong, right? So we have to work on that as well we have to consider that fact and fight against it and adapt to this and this is i think this was very obvious in in in, in the first attempt we did with the conference concert at manzi uh that i mean even though on the surface level we know we knew that the internet connection was not super good there but the kinds of struggles that we had to uh, go by were involved many, many other aspects of this that, that we also mm -hmm. have to. So that's, I mean, that's a complex topic uh, too. Mm. As I said, it could have been a day in this. Yeah. A different conference. I think um, the, it's interesting to hear just when you look at different, I mean, it's interesting just to just say, you know, okay, so there's, there's a noise scene in, in Vietnam um, you know, which is, which is fascinating, you know, that's wonderful and interesting, but it's also, you know, who's doing these things, you know, I mean, um, you know, I did, I did a workshop, um, 
And we have an agreement now with the Los Andes University in, in Bogota in Colombia, which is wonderful and it's a really interesting place and there's amazing stuff going on. But the tuition fees there aren't really cheaper than the tuition fees at the University of Birmingham. <laughs> you know, I mean, so the people who are going there are, you know, very privileged people in, in local terms um, and probably also in international terms. And those kind of disparities are interesting. I, I think you're, 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 your questioner is back, JD, though. Maybe we should let him actually ask his question. <laughs> really trying to post his question. Okay, let, 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 let me dig. Uh, da, 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 da. Open. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, here it comes. Mm. Sorry, I've lost this window. Uh, mm -hmm. do, do you have the question there? I think he's just asking whether to uh, to type or talk. Yeah. And I ah, okay. And who, who is it? Oh, Federico. Yes, allowed to talk. Welcome, Federico. You can now join us on the screen. Hi. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. We can hear you. All right. Okay, great. Where are you okay, speaking you. from? I'm in Berlin. I'm actually walking down the park while I listen to you guys and um, that's wonderful <laughs> yeah yeah it's sunny here it's nice but this is actually related to the question that i'm gonna ask uh you actually you all is pro probably like a broader reflection because i found myself you know walking down Mauer park in berlin while i listen to my colleagues uh, i i actually work with stefan in sweden uh while i listen to my colleague in Sweden speaking at a conference uh, organized in Bangkok. And so like uh, this also relates to, you know, what COVID has uh, in a way accelerated. So there's an open, a more open discussion on whether or not uh, academic conferences should take place in the same physical place or like being instead hosted fully online or partially online. Same thing goes on in the corporate world where like, you know, big companies are asking themselves, should we actually pay the rent for like offices in a fancy building or just have everyone working from home or like do a mixture of the two. And so my question to you is like, okay, let's fast forward 10, 15 years from now, what's left of place, especially in the, in the performing arts? Like, it seems as if, uh, you know, place, like the meaning of, of place itself has been like renegotiated and rediscussed to like a very, you know, radical extent. And so, like I was trying while walking down the park and listening to you, trying to speculate on whether like, uh, you know, in which direction things could go. Maybe there could even be like some sort of reactionary uh, group that sort of like somehow uh, um, uh, avoids streaming um, performances altogether and do not even record their Zoom exchanges for later use and they want they want everything to happen there and then or or maybe place like the meaning of place will be completely you know changed from from what we we think of it today or you know like uh, this kind of thought experiments and so I wanted like to ask you what you what what, what your feelings are about this of course there's not going to be like it's not that we cannot have different things at the same time but uh yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, I, I'm just curious about what you think about, uh, like, how place is being uh, reconfigured through all that is going on recently. Okay, and you, you're asking someone in specifically or the panel? Uh, well, like, uh, um, uh, um, you know, uh, Stefan mentioned place in his project, and I think I'm, I'm pretty mm -hmm. certain he would have a good answer for that. But, you know, I work mm -hmm. with him, so I can ask him whenever. <laughs> so I would open the question to whoever wants to, to, to intervene. I mean, just to turn it around a bit, I, I've, I found it quite interesting that until, until recently, until the crisis, um, place has remained so important. You know, it, it, it didn't need to, you know, in the era of SoundCloud or 
Bandcamp or any kind of online platform that the communities could be entirely virtual and yet you do still get a Vietnamese noise scene or a Berlin techno scene or a, even a Somerset sound art scene such as it is you know these things have been quite localized um, and yeah whether whether this crisis will finally make that disconnect happen or or it could just be a temporary blip I don't know but there obviously is something about actual physical groupings in actual places that that has remained important when, when it could. Maybe I can still have a go at it, even if Federico and I can discuss this next week. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. In, the, in the brief little bit, I, I uh, addressed listening and, and referred to Jean-Luc Nancy. This has a lot to do with, I think, the essence of this question when it comes to music performance, because you know, just as Jean-Luc Nancy describes listening as something that is happening in bodies and in place, um, the sharing of sound waves in a particular space, um, there is something, and there, there's, there, there are more philosophers uh, uh, of musical performance that have been thinking of this, like, uh, like um, Marc Limon, the way he thinks of how performance is a sharing of, of, of neural uh, 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 neural uh, it's on a neural level you know of, of, of movement and uh, you know so it's it's, it's, a, it's an interaction between bodies in physical space and and I think there's there's something in here which of course is not entirely negative right it, it poses many novel possibilities but we also need to consider the sort of basic fundamental facts of what music experience is and in many ways, music experience is embodied and without uh, sharing space and sharing sound in the same space, many things are lost or uh, are altered. And, you know, just as we've been discussing through the, all the talks today, what does this alteration mean? You know, it's not that, that it's impossible, it's just that it demands an, a different aesthetic like in a, in a different conference we organized on network performance uh, uh, two months ago, um, we had a presentation of uh, the Global Hyperorgan Project, which is a, uh, it's, it's a project to do with how, how to operate organs remotely. And, you know, so you work in the actual concert space, but you're not there. And you can operate several hyperorgans at the same time. And, you know, what kind of music is this that is actually produced in simultaneously in different concert halls in different parts of the world? So that type of question. Sorry, that was long. <clears throat> I think one organ is enough in most <laughs> cases. I thought so. But, but it, you know, it's also, I, th I think it's important to remember the history of this because this, I mean, this development started a long time ago and it's been, uh, we can backtrack this uh, and only go back a hundred years or the, something, you know, the change that happened to, to at least in the West with, with the chamber music practices. Uh, so there's been a gradual sort of change and disembodiment of the practice of music that's been going on for a long time. And, and I think one of the important things to remember now is, I think this is partly what Stefan is saying, but I mean, maybe focus on what is it we can do in a certain context. I mean, we can't, there's a, there's a certain kind of sharing that we can do uh, that this medium, for example, Zoom allows us to do. We can meet all here, we're all different parts of the world and that's fascinating. We're having very inspiring discussion here. So, so that that's not really thanks to Zoom. I mean, that's just a mediating layer. The, 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 the important thing is the discussion. So if we can create inspiring music through network performance, that is an achievement. It's not a step away from embodiment or, or something. It's an achievement in and of itself. So I think there's, I mean, there are many things to keep track on here, but, but, um, and as, as for the resistance, I think, you, I think you're actually onto something there. And I think this, that's, that's an important aspect too. We have to resist the, the developments in, in, to a certain extent as well. Can you still hear me? You yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, still here. great. Are you still in the no, phone? <laughs> uh, I just got out of the park. I'm walking back home now. And uh, yeah, but uh, no, thank you for the answers. And also like, I would like to um, clarify that mine wasn't a, some kind of 
like dire dystopian uh, uh, like uh, prediction of, of like placing place uh, like becoming meaningless or anything like that. It wasn't. It was more of a you know a provocation to start um, like maybe some discussion and and actually I I sort of like. Um, uh, sympathize with the answers that that, that that you gave and especially what also Henrik said right now uh, uh, like regarding you know uh, yeah, it, it being a medium and and music happening a way or the other and, and that's the achievement that's like like what what's in the spotlight but at the same time like I think we sort of like I think research has to do a whole lot of work here because uh, in my opinion, like the whole idea of embodiment is 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 kind of like I agree with what Stefan said that like uh, you know music is, is uh, made an experience by bodies in space, but at the same time, like I think I sort of missing something regarding like how this this concept can be like extended and amplified uh, because I think attention and 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 listening they're like being like to give you, this doesn't have much to do with music, but more like about my experience of attending this uh, conference this morning with you. And like, if I were to sit in a seminar room, I would be, you know, taking notes maybe, or maybe like thinking, like you know, drifting away with thoughts, but like uh, there would be certain expectations of, of about, about my embodied activities, no? Whereas here I tried, like I sort of experimented and see what it felt like uh, you know, participating to a seminar online while walking down the park or while working out or while sitting as if I was sitting in a seminar room. And somehow that like changed the overall experience and sort of like triggered thoughts that then I partly shared with you. And that, in my opinion, has a lot to do with like embodiment and space to some extent. And also with like time scales and so on and so forth. So I think that there are like some music practices that are yet to be um, explored. Because we, in, a, in the seminar series that Stefan and I organized, there was at some point a whole lot of talking about latency because it's like this recurrent theme, but uh, uh, which is fine. But like that I think applies to somehow uh, music practices that, I, uh, or not, ex not exclusively, but also to music practices that are like, aim to be like some sort of surrogate of music in the same place, whereas other practices perhaps are yet to be fully imagined and explored, if that makes sense to you. I thought that, that that's really interesting to me because it, it kind of touches on um, the role of the audience, maybe, you know, how you feel in, in receiving the thing, depending on where you are. Um, one little experience I, I wanted to share with, with a friend of mine, he runs a, a club night in Bristol and he took that online for about kind of eight weeks in, in lockdown. And it was really interesting how that evolved. Um, you know, usually like about a hundred people would, would turn up a, a, a night. And to start with, most people had their cameras and microphones turned off. So it was just like a stream really. But I noticed that over those weeks, people started to turn their cameras on and then they started to kind of create little club environments in their houses. So by week eight, people had actually got like lights on and stuff. And, you know, it was, they really started to create little clubs in their own rooms. And I think that made a huge difference. You know, if, if you're just slumped in front of your machine with your microphone turned off, then you're not really experiencing something in the same way as maybe if you've got your camera on and you're actually dancing around with some funky lights you know and I know that's a very particular experience but I wonder if that's qu quite applicable to other situations that maybe you need to be, be involved somehow as an audience. I think that's really true. Yeah. I would also think of the audience you know but it's, it's also from the performance perspective it's a very different thing to be performing in the studio right and it, it reminds me of this uh, anecdote from Anton Rubinstein in his uh, memoirs where he's uh, explaining why he always hated to play live shows on the radio. And, and you'd think that he would be more nervous, right? 
of course we all know that he wasn't um no it's the opposite so he he said i hate to play live radio shows because i always imagine that there's this husband a fat man uh you know, he's just walking into the living room where the, the woman is listening to the, the Mozart piano concerto and he shouts, can you shut off that bloody thing? I'm shaving, and he's shaving at the same time. So it's just this inner image of the, the non-listening audience. And I, I think there's, there's something to this, you know, so for, for, for us as performers, when we, don't, when we are in our living room and we don't see the audience and we don't have this interaction, I mean, there's, there's something completely different happening and again, this also needs to be considered when we're setting up these, uh, these types of performance. And live streaming in that respect is a very different thing. You know, just streaming a show from an empty theater is certainly is not the same thing. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, totally. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And um, yeah, uh, just one final thing that's just... Um, yeah, I think it just left my mind because all the walking pro probably took away my. Th th that's <laughs> okay. We, we'll have to. We'll have to. We'll have to. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to finish yeah. soon anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But okay. Shalia, Thank you for I, I, uh, for your time and uh, for um, and for your answers. Um, Thank you. For Thank you very much, Federico. I think that the, the, uh, so, so some of your questions were you actually asked many questions and. Uh, the aspect of your, the part of your questions that I, I, I thought was the most interesting is the fact that some people are becoming quite fascist about the idea of uh, doing things in the moment uh, and using this online territory as a way of, uh, to assert this. And I think uh, we've all been swimming in quantities of media for many, many years in a very exponential way now. And in a way, we are probably all moving back into a place where we'll be experiencing things in a more real time kind of way, you know, uh, despite latency issues. Because um, at the end of the day, music is about experience. It's about experiencing something in the moment. Uh, Stefan was talking about embodiment, uh, whether the physicality of the experience needs to be to involve humans or whether the vibration itself is the embodiment of music. Uh, we can now stream multi-channel audio in really good quality. Um, let's wait and see. I, I, I'm not really summarizing things here. I'm just, uh, I'm just realizing that this set of discussions is leaving us with many questions, a lot of food for thoughts. And um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I think it was a very enjoyable ex experience for me and for all of us. And uh, maybe we should do this more often now that the technology works. Any go. final comments from anyone? There's also the question of archiving all of this material and sharing it with a large public as well. Uh, as we say, we, we, we'll delete everything after the event. Let's, <laughs> it will only exist in the moment. We've lost the ephemerality of... <laughs> Of, uh, I just wanted to say thank you, JD, for um, sharing this and for uh, organizing and everything else. It's been a great, yes, thank you. Great I session. think it was a, it was a wonderful lineup. I'm really glad you you all accepted to uh, to be here at the same time. It's quite unique. And again, uh, let, let's do it again. So please please join us for the next uh, next events and of course the performance on the 28th and the 29th. And um, see you all soon. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.